Welcome to the HCI Family of Podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Welcome to the podcast. In this podcast episode, I talk with Jamie Dunaway Seal about unpacking Gen Z salary expectations. Jamie Dunaway Seal, welcome to the conversation today. Thanks for having me. It is a pleasure to be with you. Welcome back to the podcast. We've talked before and you always have great insights. Today, we're going to be talking about a recent report and data analysis that you've done, unpacking Gen Z salary expectations. And I think from a comp and benefit standpoint, from a strategic... No, I think that sums it up pretty well. All right. Very good. And remind me, where are you located? I'm located in Dallas, Texas. Wonderful. Texas, I'm joining you from uh, the Salt Lake City area in Utah. Now, Jamie, as we get started, why don't you share a little bit of just background around this analysis, the survey results, and the report? Like, why why this report? Why now? Um, why is this something that you were focusing on? Right. This is the second edition of this report. And both years, we discovered that Gen Z really does not have a good grasp on what they're actually going to make one year out of college and even into mid-career. And, you know, this is really important because, you know, as they're, you know, just, you know, financial planning, they've got a lot of debt coming out of college and, you know, they're, you know, they're looking for jobs and they're going to need to find a job that they can live on and save and pay off their debt. And if you don't have a good idea of what the, what the salary range is for your field, you know, you might really be in for a surprise. And so we just want to give, you know, we just want kids to be as educated as they can coming out of college. Yeah. And, you know, I, I love the idea of just giving everyone straight out of school, a really great starting salary. Uh, I wish we could pay people more, but we also have to have a firm grasp on reality so that we can plan accordingly. Uh, And that's that's part of the challenge. You know, it's part of the challenge of when students go into the university setting and choose a major Um, like reasonably. What can you expect? What what's the cost of that education? What kinds of student loans are you going to have to take out? What can you expect reasonably from a salary in that career field? And we know that some careers just pay better than others. And uh, I'm all for a broad liberal arts education. I'm all for um, the humanities and the social sciences. I'm a sociology undergrad myself. Um, but it also comes with the realization, you know, one of the reasons of why I went on for grad school is because I knew that, you know, graduating with a, a bachelor's in sociology alone probably wouldn't get me to where I wanted to be, right? And so just having that understanding, I think, is just really, really important. I don't want to discourage any student from pursuing, you know, their passion or pursuing the the, the field that they're super interested in, um, but you just have to understand what those realities are. Right. One of the interesting things we found in the study was that most students say that they think about salary when they're choosing a major, but sometimes when they get into it, they're like, this really isn't for me. Um, So like engineering students, you know, they're probably going to make a really good salary right out of college, but a lot of them, uh, you know, regretted their major. Um, It could be that high stress environment or, um, you know, it's just not really interesting to them. Whereas on the flip side, uh, psychology majors who are probably not going to make the highest salary right out of college uh, had, you know, the least regret. I think only 37% regretted their major, which is still a good chunk, but it wasn't as much as some of the other the other fields that we saw. Yeah, and I forget the report that came out. Maybe you're referencing it, or maybe this is from your own analysis, but there was a report that came out not long ago, uh, maybe a few months back, 
that had the 10 least regretted majors. Um, is that what you're referring to or did you do your own analysis there? Right. This was from our own analysis. Okay. And, you know, it's it is interesting, like, you know, to some extent, um, you know, if you have a good salary, like, you know, you're you're going to be less stressed financially, but you also like money doesn't buy everything. It doesn't buy, yeah. you know, complete happiness. So sometimes it really is worth, um, you know, following your interests and following your passions. Yeah. Well, and just anecdotally, I'll, I'll just share my own background. So I switched majors several times and, and I ended up in accounting. I was at a, a top university in a top accounting program, top, you know, ranked top one, two or three every year you know, I was good at it. You know, I, I knew that if I did this program and I finished, I would be set. Like I would have a successful career. I'd have a stable career. I would, I would uh, have a good salary with lots of opportunities for growth, etc. The only problem was I hated it. <laughs> and so, you know, I was a year into the program and, and I just really didn't like it. Um, I, and I just, the more and more I thought about like, this is what I'm going to slog through every day for the rest of my career. I couldn't envision it. And that's when I switched. I switched my major one more time. I went from this like top notch accounting program to sociology and people thought I was nuts for doing that. Um, and, and maybe I was, but you know what? I'm really glad that I didn't find myself. I'm 44 now. I'm really glad I'm not like 44 stuck in a job I hate. Um, and you know, instead I was able to, to carve out a different path and I found success in the path I've taken, even though it was totally different. And, uh, you know, there's, there's no, there, there's nothing wrong with people doing a job that they're good at, that takes care of their needs, their family's needs, pay the bills and they don't love it. You know, I, I, I am an advocate for just hard, honest work and not everyone is privileged enough to be able to be picky and choosy about the work that they do. That's fine, you know, but to the extent that you do have a choice, to the extent that you you have the ability to um, carve out your own path while taking care of the needs of your family and everything, um, then yeah, all else being equal, look for the thing that you love doing. Look for the thing that's going to bring you uh, engagement and passion and happiness and, and allow you to do what you do best each and every day. Uh, and you, you, you know, you're, you're going to be less likely to find yourself in the throes of a midlife crisis, <laughs> you know, 10, 15, 20 years into your career, if, if you do that. And that's not also not to say that every job doesn't have the stuff you don't like, you know, I love being a professor. I don't love grading papers, you know, but so there's, there's things that I love, things that I don't like as much. Um, that's just the reality. Um, but finding what you can love makes a difference. And, and so even though I made that choice, even though I knew you know, an undergrad in sociology versus an undergrad in accounting from a top national um, program, I knew that that would be a huge trade-off <laughs> in terms of what I could expect. But I also knew in making that calculus, like going through that, that thought process, I also knew that meant for sure grad school. You know, I wasn't just going to stop at my bachelor's. And so that was part of how I, I moved forward in my path. Um, okay, so enough about me and enough about my own little anecdotal story here. I think lots of people can resonate with similar types of uh, paths in the, a university setting and as you're trying to navigate early in your career. Um, so we have this expectation. Uh, lay out for us some of what the report tells us around the the salary expectation for, for those leaving school, moving straight into the university setting or straight, right. so, straight into the workforce. Yes, we found that most Gen Z students expect to make about $85,000 one year uh, out of school, so an entry-level job, um, but the reality is that they're going to get more like 55000 That's the starting salary on average across the U.S., and then, you know, most students aren't going to get that. So um, they're yeah. probably going to have to compromise. And we found that like 97%, nearly all students said that they would accept a lower starting salary in exchange for some, you know, some good benefits. But even then, their minimum, they say, is $72,000, yeah. which again, is still too high. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really not accept. what the mark. Yeah, it's really not what the market will bear. You know, no. it, it obviously depends on discipline and, and what you study in school and the career path you're taking. But, you know, I think it's much more reasonable for the average college student to come out thinking, you know, maybe 50, 55, 60 on the high end 
that's a much more realistic expectation. Yet, you know, you're you're talking about the low end being seventy two thousand. Um, so there, there's a huge disconnect there. Yeah, exactly. And I think that just comes down to, um, you know, there has been a lot of talk um, just about, you know, employers wanting to really retain and attract good, um, good employees. And so they're offering a lot of, you know, pay raises and incentives to get these good employees. And so I think Gen Z might be hearing this and listening to this and thinking, oh, yeah, I'm going to make a lot of money. And it's it's still just their their expectations are too high. Um, the starting salary has uh, increased a little bit, but not to these levels that they're expecting. Yeah, sure. So so how do we start to bridge that gap? Because I mean that's not good for anyone. If 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 an incoming early career professional has an unrealistic unrealistic expectation like that, they're going to get super frustrated in the job search. They end up eventually they're going to have to kind of re-establish, you know, their expectations are going to end up taking a job that's paid way lower, which means they're probably going to enter the workforce and start in, in that first job, probably feeling unfairly compensated, probably um, a little discouraged and frustrated around what they're making. Um, so from their standpoint, I, I think recalibration is really, really important if they're going to have a good launch pad, you know, for the start of their career from the employer standpoint, if you want to attract and retain good people, you don't want to start from a place of people just feeling like they're being vastly underpaid. You know, if, if I start a job and I think I'm getting paid 25% lower than I should be, you know, that's not a good place to begin um, for anybody. So how, how do we start to, to bridge that gap in terms of these expectations? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think it starts with education, like these colleges, uh, career centers, they they really need to to help students figure this out by providing lots of resources. And, you know, to some extent, the onus is on the student, like they need to, um, you know, talk to their professors. Like a lot of times, like I majored in journalism, like, you know, my professors were very clear about what I would probably make uh, right out of college. Um, so just, you know, ask, ask their teachers if they'll do, if they do an internship, um, you know, ask their boss, ask their coworker, and that will help them really get a good gauge of what they can expect. And uh, on the employer side, I think uh, clear career frameworks are are really helpful so that new employees can see like where they where they could go in in that particular job at that particular company. And so they have an idea and they can set realistic expectations. Just having that that dialogue is going to be really important uh, in the university space. You know, I want my students to have, you know, we talk about realistic job previews all the time. I'm in the HR space. So we talk about realistic job previews from a variety of angles, just from an HR perspective. Certainly part of that means just what is realistic for you as a student leaving this program? Like we think we prepare our students really well. We think we launch them well. We think they're going to be able to have success. But, you know, if you think you're going to leave and magically get that 80 grand a year job without a master's degree, I, I think you're probably smoking something. You know, it's it's just not going to be the reality for like the vast majority of students. It's possible, but it's it's just probably not going to happen. So, you know, with that said, you know, the on the professor side, on the advising side in the university setting, we just need to be realistic with our students and, and be clear in set, helping to set those expectations. Um, and on the employer side, I think we need to be crystal clear uh, when we're going through the recruitment and the, the, the screening and the selection and the interviewing process. Be, be transparent. You know, that's something I feel very strongly about, that we should have less of the opaqueness around hiring salary benefits that are offered with the position. I think we should be transparent in job postings, let people know right up front what um, what the range is and what is reasonable for this position so that people won't waste their time. They don't waste your time going through the whole interview process, trying to get a job and then realizing, oh, this is 20% less than I expected. Um, you know, I see that all the time. So on the employer side, think about, the applicant experience. Think about the the bringing this new person in, and if it, if it was you, what would you hope for, and what would you expect, and and act accordingly. Uh, I don't think employers are malicious ever 
in in trying to like pull one over on people they're bringing into the uh, to the organization. But I, I do think they often are not as transparent as they could or should be. And and it's not malicious, but it is it's just a lack of a, attentiveness and it's a lack of really thinking through, you know, what would I want if I were in this position looking, you know, to join this company? And most people would say, yeah, I would like some clarity around what the pay actually is, what the benefits are. I'd like consistency in how that's discussed throughout the process so that if I do get selected, I can get onboarded and it's going to be a relatively smooth process. And, and I can start from a positive place of feeling good about where I'm at, not feeling like I had to settle, not feeling like I got cheated from day one at this company. Yeah, I do want to piggyback on what you said about uh, including salary ranges on job applications. I think that's really important. Um, again, so just no one is wasting their time. And uh, just, you know, personal experience that I've had in HR and recruiting is like, I know that our company includes the ranges on the applications and the feedback that we've gotten from applicants has been really positive. They say that's one of the best things that, you know, that they experienced, uh, you know, going through our recruitment process. And so I, that's another just really great way to, to attract, um, you know, the best employees. Good. Well, what are some of the other uh, results that come out of this survey? Right. So we found that um, most students, um, they have unrealistic salary expectations, but they also have unrealistic expectations about how they're going to get a job and how they're going to um, just progress in that job. Like most students think that they're going to be promoted like within one year, the average is about two or three. Um, they also think that uh, they're never going to have to work an entry-level job, which is highly unlikely. And that this one does have maybe some weight to it, that it's more about um, who you know, like, uh, you know, your family and personal connections are going to help you get a job more than your actual skills. And well, you know, I think finding a job is a little bit about who you know. Um, you definitely need to be qualified to actually do that job. Yeah. So who you know might help get you in the door for the interview. Um, I think that that's absolutely true. Uh, networks matter. <laughs> the network effects are huge. Um, but unless your your parent is like the CEO, you know that that connection isn't going to help you get that job if you don't have the skill set to go along with it. So it might get you in the door for the interview or just to be considered, have the start of the conversation. But if there are tons of really qualified people who have the skill sets and you don't, forget about it. Like you're just not going to get selected. Your business yeah, are too I, competitive. <laughs> the companies aren't going to shoot themselves in the foot, you know? Exactly. I think it's really important to build those skills, like those practical skills as a student, because, you know, you're your resume only is going to get you so far. Like it's important to have a good resume, um, but you, you want to show them the practical skills and, you know, projects that you have accomplished as well. Not just like, oh, I have a 4.0 GPA. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something I try to tell students all the time. Uh, it's about the practical application of knowledge in, in our program. That's going to be really important for you. And that's why we build in internships. We build in lots of um, consulting projects into our courses the students don't always love it. Sometimes they would rather just kind of do an easier class where they don't have to do that kind of stuff, but it's going to make all the difference in the world when they're applying for positions and they can demonstrate actual experience doing actual projects, working through the challenges that are innate with those and just demonstrating how they have been able to apply what, what they've learned. Um, and it's not about the GPA. Uh, it's, it's, it's about the skills. And so you know, getting that 4.0, that's great. And I know pe some people have that goal. Um, but sometimes I think one of the best things that can, can happen to a student who's like a 4.0 student is that first A minus or that first B plus that they get that then kind of frees them from the bondage of like that constant expectation of trying to get a 4.0. Because frankly, nobody cares in, in business. They just do not, uh, especially after the first job. You know, whatever you did in your un your undergrad, once you get that first job, it's all about your performance. It's all about what you're able to accomplish in that first job, your, your university experience and your GPA and your projects and all those sorts of things that helps you get that first job. It's not really going to be all that relevant after that. 
right? In terms of just the raw like job application experience and and what people are going to be looking at when they're making those hiring decisions. So GPA is just on much on the lower end uh, of what's going to be really really important. Uh, even grad programs are looking less at GPA now than they used to, uh, in terms of you know being a factor for admissions. So you know just keep that in mind for any anyone listening who's early career or in college, you know keep keep those things in mind as you're trying to reasonably think through what you need to focus your limited time on because everyone's busy, everyone's juggling lots of stuff. College students today, you know, at least at my university, it, it, you know, the call the average college student today is different than maybe the, co the average college student a generation ago. Many more of them are working. A lot, a lot of them are non-traditional. A lot of them have families. Um, they're juggling a whole lot of stuff. It's not just like going to college for four years and just like going through your classes. That, at least at my university, that's not how it is for almost anybody. So, you know, just recognizing how you're going to prioritize given limited bandwidth, limited time and resources um, is important, you know, as, as you're making the calculus uh, towards your future. Um, well, very good. Anything else that you would like to highlight from this report that I, that you think is really important in terms of Gen Z expectations in the workplace? Yeah, I think just one last thing is, you know, you talked about earlier, just kind of starting out from a state of disappointment. And, you know, we we do see that in our study. Um, gosh, I hate to end, end like this on a downer. Um, but, you know, when when students kind of are faced with reality, they're like, oh, man, like they're they're really they really are disappointed. Like a lot of them think they're going to have to get a second job, you know, move back in with their parents. They're not going to be able to do like all the fun things that they want to do um, as an adult. So I think that this just really reiterates that um, the education is, is really important. Uh, as we wrap things up today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, your team, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Yeah, so anyone who wants to read the full report can go to uh, realestatewitch.com slash, slash research and they'll find this study as well as um, all of our other reports. And they can connect with uh, me at Jamie Dunway on Twitter as well as um, at Clever Real Estate. And, uh, you know, as for our final word goes, um, you know, I think that um, this report is, you know, we all we all kind of like to dunk on other generations We're like, oh, you know, uh, I can't believe that they believe this. But, um, you know, I think that it's just we need to have, you know, we need to be helpful and we need to try and prepare these students as best as they can coming out of college. Yeah, well said, Jamie. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Jamie can do for you. Check out the report and other resources. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe. They can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.